perhaps the best and most known words in all the world are those that you have just heard David Roper read from the pen of Matthew and Mark and Luke. In contrast to a very limited religion, Christ in these words gave unto us a worldwide revolutionary great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then, of course, he told us a condition and the results of those who believed and obeyed that great commission. All of us know the importance of such terms as marching orders, Magna Carta, final charge, constitution. These are words that bring to our mind immediately an urgent appeal of great significance and importance. And yet perhaps in the religious world today, the Great Commission, even though known, is perhaps unknown. The Great Commission is the marching orders for the New Testament church. Everything that went before it was in preparation of it. And everything that has come after it has been the result of it. For example, when you pick up your Bible and read an Old Testament prophecy like Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. And then he continues by saying, They shall not teach every man his brother, but they shall all know the Lord. That's in Jeremiah 31, the Old Testament. In Hebrews 8, 8 through 13, in the New Testament, we find that quoted. Everything written before was written in preparation, and everything after has been the result of it. In Joel chapter 2, 28 through 31, Joel made the statement that in the last days, things would happen. And Peter on the day of Pentecost standing up with the eleven, in Acts chapter 2, 17, said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In Luke 24 and verse 44, Christ said, These are my words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must need be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, Ye shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Great Commission, penned by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is a marching orders of the New Testament church. In having David Roper to read these three accounts, we're not trying just to make a point or trying to prove a thought. But I believe there is something here that is very, very unique for any God-fearing, Bible-believing individual. And that simply is this. Any logical truth, or should I say any truth, that is accepted by man's heart has following that acceptance some logical impossibilities. Now let me explanify that statement. And let me repeat it first. Any truth, when accepted, has some logical impossibilities following that acceptance. If I convince you that two times two is four, now then if that is a truth and you accept it, then there are some things that logically you know that are an impossibility. That is, two times two can't be eight. And two times two cannot be two. For when a thing is stated to be true, then the opposite needs to be noticed. And if we were to make the statement that the world is round, and God says it is three times in the Old and New Testaments combined, then there are some things following that truth that are logical impossibilities. If I accept the fact the world is round, then I cannot accept the fact it is square. In the Great Commission, I believe there's a series of impossibilities. I want a God-believing, Bible-believing individual accepts the truth of God as read from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Following that acceptance, there will be some things impossible for us to see and do. 
First of all, let me suggest that there are some impossibilities, if I believe the Great Commission, to the world. If I believe what Matthew penned and Mark penned in the Great Commission, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Once I state, yes, I believe the Great Commission, then it would be impossible for me to overlook the importance of either faith or baptism. For example, who is it that's going to be saved? Is it he that believeth? No, sir, it isn't. Is it he that is baptized? No, sir, it isn't. But Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So don't you see when you accept the truth of a great commission, you could not overlook the importance of either faith or baptism. Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision evadeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith working through love. The eunuch in Acts 8 was driving along in his chariot, reading Isaiah 53, when the evangelist Philip came to him. And the evangelist said, Do you understand what you read? And he said, How can I accept some man tell me? And then the Bible says, beginning at this scripture, he preached unto him Jesus. And as they drove along, they came to a certain water. The Bible says, the eunuch said, behold, water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? But he was about to overlook a very important step in the Great Commission, faith. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the man answered about his belief. And then, of course, they stopped the chariot. They went down into the water both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The question, is a man saved by faith? Is a fine question. Is a man saved by grace? Is a fine question. And I wouldn't discuss those two. The world understands that. But at what point is a man saved by faith? Nowhere does the Bible say you're saved at the point of faith without any further act of works or faith being manifested. For an example, Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 and the first 14 verses, the prophet of God said, Go and wash in the river Jordan seven times. He went to dip these seven times. But he was cleansed, not when he had the faith to listen, not when he had the faith to go, not when he dipped one or two or three times, and he wasn't six sevenths clean when he dipped six times. But verse 14 says, when he did according to the saying of the word of God. The same is true about the walls of Jericho in Hebrews 11 and verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been compassed about for seven days. And what about the blind man in John chapter 9, especially in verse 6 and 7? Jesus spit on the ground and made clay of the spittle. He anointed the man's eyes and said, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the Bible says he went and washed and came forth seeing. Who is it going to be saved? He that believeth? No. He that is baptized? No. But he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. In understanding then the Great Commission, I need to understand that there are some impossibilities that follow its divine acceptance. When my heart, my human heart, Except that divinely written word, I cannot minimize faith or baptism. If I say that I'm saved by faith or faith alone, then I have a hard time with Acts 11 and verse 18, where only repentance is mentioned. I have a hard time with 1 John 2.23, where only confession is mentioned. And I would have a hard time with 1 Peter 3.21, where only baptism is mentioned. If I can take faith in John 3.16 and say that a man is saved by faith and that alone, then I can take repentance or confession and say that a man is saved by those. But some will say John 3.16 does not mention baptism, therefore it's not necessary. John 3.16 does not mention repentance or confession. And by the same token of argument, therefore they are not necessary. But there is something else that I want us to note. And that is, if I believe the Great Commission, it would be impossible for me to feel slighted Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Go and teach all the nations, state Matthew and Mark, in the first one and two verses of the Great Commission by their pen. Jesus said, Whosoever believeth, John 3, 16. He said, Whosoever cometh shall drink, John 7, 37, Revelation 22 and verse 17. Whosoever will, let him come. Christ said, I am the door, John 10, verses 7, 8, and 9. Made the statement twice. That door is never closed. And if I miss heaven, I cannot blame God. I cannot read the Great Commission and forever feel slighted. And so the Bible makes the statement, He died for all, Hebrews 2, verse 9. He tasted a death for every man, Matthew 20, 28, and 1 Timothy 2. Therefore, when Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, that includes every man. But it would be impossible also to overlook when or where the gospel of Christ and the church began. The Great Commission according to Luke 24, teaching repentance and remission of sins among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You can't believe the Great Commission and overlook when or where the Great Commission began. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in the Isaiah chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, Now the word that Amos, or Isaiah rather, the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Behold, the mountain of the Lord's house to be established in the top of the mountains, and all people shall flow into it. And he says, The law and the word shall go forth out of Zion and out of Jerusalem. Jesus said, Ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Acts 1 and verse 8. And the Bible says in Acts 2, beginning in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound as of a rushing of a mighty wind. The Bible says in verse 5, Now there were dwelling at Jerusalem. That's the place. And you cannot overlook the place when nor where the gospel of Christ began if you believe in the Great Commission. But in the fourth place, be impossible for you to mistake the sin of authority or really to say there's nothing in a name if you believe the Great Commission. Christ said, Go ye therefore and teach all the nations. And then he said, Baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So many today say, Oh, there's nothing in a name. We're all headed for the same place. But that's wrong. There is something in a name. All Bible authority must be done in the name of Christ. For whatsoever you do in word, or in deed, in word that would be our preaching, in deed that would be our practicing, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Does in the name of mean by the authority of? Let the Bible comment upon the Bible. In the book of Acts in chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 and going through verse 10, they said, by what power or what name or what authority did you do this? And they said at the name of Jesus Christ. Isn't there anything in a name? Yes. Authority is in the name of Christ. Remission of sins is in the name of Christ, Luke 24, 47. Salvation is in Christ, Acts 4 and verse 12, for there is no other name given under heaven wherein you must be saved. We're baptized into the name, Acts 19, verse 5. And that name into which we were baptized is a name above every name. In the heaven and on the earth, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. But then as I think about the Great Commission, if I'm a believer, but I've never yet really obeyed the gospel of Christ, there'd be a series of impossibilities to me. I cannot read the Great Commission and say, yes, I accept that as a truth. And then how certain beliefs, for instance, it would be impossible for me to believe or to mistake that the center of authority has been delegated to one man. In Colossians 1 and verse 18, and hath put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that fulfilleth all in all, in verse 24, speaks about the church being the body. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He has all authority and he has all power 
And the Bible says, having gone into heaven, authorities and rulers and powers being made subject to him, 1 Peter 3, 22. And he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him, Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. It would be impossible for me to believe then that Christ has all authority as taught in Matthew 28 and verse 18 and then mistake and think that God has delegated authority to one man, say Christ himself. Christ touched John on the shoulder in Revelation 1, 27 and 8 or rather 17 and 18 and he said, John, I was dead but I'm alive forevermore and I have in my hand the keys of death and Hades. Christ has all authority. But if I read the Great Commission, it would be impossible for me to have the mistaken idea that I could mistake the very center of authority. Authority does not reside in Moses. It does not reside in David. It does not reside in the Old Covenant. It does not reside in those two former dispensations. And authority today, religiously speaking, does not reside in some synod or in some church or in some man who has lifted himself up by the voice of the people because the voice of the people is not always the voice of God. The Bible says God raised him up and declared him to be his son. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. But Christ said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Who has religious authority besides Christ? In John 6, 68, some of the disciples turned and walked no more with Christ. And Jesus said, Will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life everlasting. On the Mount of Transfiguration, with Peter, James, and John, Moses and Elijah, God said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. In Caesarea Philippi, when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, it was Christ who said, Upon this rock I'll build my church. And Christ has all authority. But it would be in the third place impossible for me to minimize the duty of being baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Let us note clear, carefully this point. Christ said, If you love me, Keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, John 14, 21. If a man love me, he will keep my word, John 14, 23. If a man says, I love God, and keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar. But whoso keepeth his word, verily in him hath the love of God been perfected. And the Lord said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not the things I have commanded you, Matthew 7, 21, Luke 6, 46, a parallel thought. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves because they were not being baptized of that baptism that was available at that time. Have you fussed and fought and argued against baptism? How could you say, I believe the Great Commission, when Christ and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and then say, baptism plays no part in a man's salvation, as one just recently has and as they have always done in times past. Showing a point of doctrine. Is baptism a command? Did Jesus say, if a man love me, he'll keep my word? If a man loves me, he'll keep my commandments? No inspired man of God like the Apostle Peter could ever command baptism. When he met the Gentile Cornelius in, in Caesarea, Cornelius said, we are here to hear all things commanded the other Lord, Acts 10, verse 33. Well, when Peter came, what did he command? Among other things, the Bible said, and he commanded them to be baptized. Acts 10, and verse 48. But it would be impossible for me to believe the Great Commission and to confuse two laws God has in our religious world. And I believe our religious world has tempered and confused these two laws. God has a law for the alien sinner, the one who has never responded, never obeyed, who has never let faith dwell in his heart. 
which comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. God has a law for that man. The law said you must hear, Romans 10, 17. You must believe, John 8, 21 and 24. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, Luke 13, 3 and 5. You must confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And you must be buried with Christ in baptism, Colossians 2, 12, Romans 6, 3 and 4. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How many people have put on Christ? As many of you that were baptized into Christ. But then, God doesn't just have a law for the alien sinner that says, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But God has a law for that member, that branch and divine, who has heard and has been obedient, but who has fallen away, who is in sin and overcome. Like Peter said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. The Bible warns against falling away, tells how to keep from falling away, tells what to do when I do fall away, and the Bible gives examples of those who have fallen away. Peter on Pentecost was saved, but in Acts 2, or rather Galatians 2, 11, Paul said through verse 14, he stood condemned. Why? Because of racial prejudice. And the eunuch said, I believe. Others said, I believe, and they were baptized. But like the Samaritans who fell, like Simon who fell, you and I can fall. We urge you today, please believe the great commission of Christ. Sweet me, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footprints fall. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.